Well, uh, let's try to get started. I know you are uh, going to be particularly excited to meet and to hear uh, Nicholas Forgo's talk today. And he's going to be around all day today and tomorrow. And so uh, he's helping with a number of sessions uh, because a number of our sessions could use another perspective, an international perspective. So I, I think you'll find him fascinating and he's going to look uh, particularly about the effects on medical data. So I'm not gonna take up any more time. Please welcome Professor Forgo. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, Deborah. It's really a pleasure and an honor and an intimidating moment at the same time to stand here um, and to um, offer you another European in this time, an Austrian slash German approach um, on the topic. And let me start by a very short disclaimer, or I would call it possibly also a kind of, you know, uh, guidance or guide how to, how to take this presentation. Uh, when I started to read um, how U.S. academics um, um, understood the first drafts of the General Data Protection Regulation, one of the articles that I found rather quickly was an article of one of the scholars of this law school here uh, writing um, about the right to be forgotten, uh, Jeffrey Rosen, who is also one of the, one, an author and editor of one of the, uh, one of, uh, one very important book on, um, on Brandeis and therefore also very well known to me. So he wrote an article about the right to be forgotten in the Stanford Law Review and there is one sentence in it that I would like to quote which is, Europeans have a long tradition of declaring abstract privacy rights in theory that they fail to enforce in practice. Um, and in a way this is very true uh, and this is probably my academics perspective which is of course different from the one that um, a representative of a data protection authority needs to give but this is in a way um, perhaps uh, a, a way to better understand why Europeans have sometimes very strict approaches on the first view and on a second view then things are a little bit different. And I would also like to give you a second disclaimer here, which has something to do with this screenshot. I don't know whether any of you is old enough to know this. Um, I am old enough. Uh, I was born in 1968. That was screened in 1983. Uh, and it, it got, today one would call this viral. It got worldwide uh, attention. Um, and what you see here is, uh, is a screenshot from, from the famous Apple spot uh, advertising the Macintosh and the final sentence of this uh, of this spot that you can see on YouTube I, I did not uh, show it here because I'm not sure about the copyright implication so I just uh, I just do this here uh, so the very final sentence of this uh, of this spot is 1984 won't be like 1984 and in a way, that was also very, very true because what the technology that was announced then in 1983 when this spot was screened looked like this, right? So this is the machine we are talking about. This is the Macintosh uh, having a mouse, having a floppy disk and being revolutionary then in 1983 in a way. However, 1983 is not only the date when this, uh, when this movie was shown, it's also the date when um, a public census took place in Germany, right in these years, very, very long time ago. A public census took place in Germany using these forms here, uh, asking for very, very basic questions like, uh, where were you born, what's your mother tongue, etc and leading to a very, very influential decision of the German Constitutional Court, which then, in 1983, found a fundamental right in the existing German uh, jurisdiction and uh, constitution, which is the right to informational self-determination, how they called it. And the reasoning behind that was, in a nutshell, that a social order in which individuals can no longer assert who knows what about them 
and when and the legal order that makes this possible would not be compatible with the right to informational self-determination. The problem then for the German Constitutional Court was there was no such right in the Constitution, no, nothing about informational self-determination in the Constitution. So the German Constitutional Court needed to find a source for this argument, and it found that source not only there that it said that self-determination is an elementary prerequisite for the functioning of a free society, but it also said that the place to find this in the German Constitution is Article 1, which is about human dignity, and in Article 2, which is about the general personality right. So this is, this is important to understand that as there was nothing in the Constitution, this is the place to find. And this is uh, probably the most prominent and most fundamental place you can find in a jurisdiction to start at the first article of your constitution. And since then, uh, the German understanding of uh, data protection or self-determination or um, privacy has made its way through European thinking and finally made it also in the European constitution in a way because also the European Constitution, the, the Charter on Fundamental Rights, on the one hand has an article on human dignity, Article 1, just like the German Constitution, but it also has an Article 7 and an Article 8 on, a, on privacy and on protection of personal data. So this is what you need to, uh, to read. This is all that you, need you, that you need to read, because these are the fundamental reasonings behind everything on top of this. And again, this is primary law, this is constitutional court, so it's above the general data protection regulation, and it remains untouched by the general data protection regulation. The Article 8 on the protection of personal data is therefore, in my view, the, the key to understand how, Europe, how first Germans and then many Europeans started to think about uh, data protection. And it starts already to be important with the very first word. The very first word is everyone. So everyone means everyone. There is no distinctions between citizens and non-citizens here. Everyone who is under the protection of this framework is to be protected insofar as personal data is in the game. The problem here is after more than 20 years of working in data protection, I still can't answer the question what that means. I don't know what personal data means because there are so many different interpretations out there asking questions about whether identifiability is, uh, needs to be attributed to the controller only or to any other person. That's the key question here, why this is so tough, right? Is it, is it identifiable and therefore personal if I use your IP address although I don't know that you are sitting behind the computer, but I need a third person telling me this. We needed more than 25 years of legal debate on this very single question on IP addresses and still don't have an answer on this. So disclaimer here, personal data is a difficult word but and a difficult term. However, it gives us possibly some orientation here. So everyone whose personal data is processed is protected. If you are protected, then you have the right that these data need to be fairly processed, that they need to be purpose-related processed, so there needs to be a re relation between the purpose for which the data was collected with the purpose for which the data is used. There is informed consent, one, of the, uh, one important concept here, and you do have user rights, all kinds of user rights. And on top of this, this is the reason why the first speaker is so prominent um, in Europe. On top of this, you have an ex-ante control by independent authorities. So it's not only the user, but data protection authorities play a very important role on this, in this, and they have to be independent. This is the reason why data protection authorities are, in a way, strange animals, also in Europe, uh, legal frameworks, because of this very reason, which comes from this 1983 idea when there were very few computers and they needed to be controlled by state organs and it was quite easy then to control them. So European data protection law in 20 seconds goes like this. Processing of personal data is forbidden 
illegal. Please repeat. Yes, okay, processing is illegal. And there are only two exceptions of this. Either there is a permission by law or the data subject has consented to this. Since then, as you know, uh, the world has become much more complex than in 1983. No longer censors, no longer paper forms. IT is everywhere and all these buzzwords are everywhere and they are constantly screened everywhere. And you can bring them together in one sentence, which is if the product is for free, you are the product. And still, this rule applies. And what I'm going to do now is that I will, uh, in, in, in a kind of second, first chapter after this introduction, is that I will give you, uh, try to give you a short overview about how Europeans deal with this and why this might be of interest to, uh, to you as well. So the first typical answer to this golden rule then is, okay, then let's ask for informed consent. Consent is the solution. And in particular, in medical research and medical treatment, consent is seen as a solution because a medical, typical medical scenario, as you see it here on this uh, painting here, which is more than 2,000 years old, a typical medical scenario of treatment is based on trust and confidence. It's very much about sensitive information and it has a lot to do with dignity and autonomy of the patient. And then it's very natural to say, okay, ask the patient and ask for informed consent. The issue now with informed consent is, is that there is a power game in there and that it's not that easy for a patient to find the right balance between public and personal interests in that game. And he is not very well protected in that game, the patient, because consent as a concept is a very, very old concept. It goes back to the Roman law, volenti non fit in uria. If you don't have anything to say, say it in Latin. So volenti, uh, volenti non fit in uria. So the patient should be the one free to decide. And if he decides and if he's properly informed, things are easy. When you look at it a little bit closer, um, things are not that easy any longer, and there are two reasons for this. Let me start with the very first one, um, which brings us back again into Germany and into German thoughts on uh, constitutional rights, which is a case that was brought in front of a German court with the fol following facts. There was a dwarf, a so-called dwarf, a so-called dwarf making his living out of offering a specific service at a fun fair, which was that you could pay a certain amount of money and then you, then you could throw that person. And at the very end of the evening, the person who threw the, the person for the longest distance received 50% of the payments that, uh, that that person had earned in that, during that day. That was the way this person made his living. And the question then was whether that would be appropriate, whether that would be um, a way that is legally possible to make a living out of this. And the answer given by that court was no, no. This is, this is a way uh, of making money that so intensely affects this person's dignity that the person herself can't agree to this. And as I said, may not agree to this. And as I said before, as human dignity is the source of this, this idea uh, makes its way now through European thinking when it comes to data protection. And one of the most prominent examples that I would like to show and share with you is the one of Giovanni Buttarelli, who is at the moment the European data protection supervisor. So the, 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 the colleague of our first speaker, um, on a European level, who wrote an opinion last year, this year actually, who wrote an opinion on this year um, about a very technical directive, not of interest here, but mentioning a very, very interesting question there, which was again, whether personal data can be seen as an equivalent for money, so that contracts which have personal data as um, as, as the thing that the consumer offers to the, uh, to the service provider need to be seen as, in a way, a contract similar to buying goods. 
And what Giovanni Buttarelli wrote in this opinion was the following sentence. There might well be a market for personal data, just like there is tragically a market for live human organs, but that does not mean that we can or should give that market the blessing of legislation. One cannot monetize and subject the fundamental right to a simple commercial transaction, even if it's the individual concerned by the data who is a party to the transaction. So this is quite the same thought that I um, offered you before on this uh, person being thrown on the fair. Um, now in its um, uh, variant on data protection. And there's a second issue when it comes to um, informed consent uh, from a European perspective as the legal basis for, uh, for uh, processing of personal information. And this issue comes with the papers and the terms because nobody likes to read them. This is my example that I always use um, in this scenario. This is about a, an April 1st fool fun that was made by a computer uh, a game service provider who on the 1st of April of 2010 asked uh, people signing up for this game on that day to agree on transferring their immortal soul. <laughs> and in order to make that more attractive not to agree on this, they also offered $10 vouchers for those who did not agree. The problem was that after one day of offering this, there were 7,500 sold souls and less than 10 vouchers that needed to be given. And why is this? Because nobody reads these terms. If you needed to read them, uh, it would be lengthy. People even make fun of this um, on European websites now that nobody reads them because whatever happens, no, so don't, care, don't worry, many of examples here uh, that people don't like to read this. And this is not only true for websites, but it's also true for informed consent forms that are used in clinical trials. So the, the, the most prominent example I found in my research, in my research that, I under, that I did with a colleague from the medical school was a 109 pages informed consent form for one single clinical trial involving minors. Right? So parents being confronted with a, with a life-threatening disease of their kid are given a 109-pager in order to give informed consent on, on their child participating in this trial um, on the very first day of treatment. So if consent then is possibly not the best possible out way out, then let's look for the other one, which is permission by law. And this is probably why the fuzz with all the general data protection regulation comes from because the law at the moment in Europe, forgive me, I'm an academic, so it's not important what I say, but I, I'm completely free in saying whatever I want. So I, I make use of this now. So the existing situation in Europe is not good, right? It's not good. It's not good for very basic reasons, which is it's very diverse. The law is very diverse. We don't only have 28 different laws. We have more than 28 different data protection authorities. Just in Germany, to mention one of them, we have 18 data protection authorities, one for every region, one for the federal nation, and one on top because Bavaria is always different. So Bavaria has two. Um, so we have a, 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 an army of people speaking about the topic. We have a lack of enforcement, a clear lack of enforcement. Uh, we have, when it comes to clinical scenarios, uh, ethics committees also dealing with privacy issues as a kind of shadow data protection authorities. And we have no data protection offices in many countries at the moment in Europe. So nobody in the clinic, nobody in the trial specifically taking care um, of the issues. And on top of all this, we have this purpose limitation principle that I mentioned before, saying that there is a fundamental distinction to be made between treatment and research, and data that is processed for treatment should not be, per se, used for research and vice versa. So the outcome of this situation, how it looks at the moment, is 
that people like me constantly need to apologize for the jungle, for the mess, for the might nightmare that we are um, seen to be responsible for. So when I come to an IT meeting or a medical doctor's meeting, my typical way of behaving there is saying sorry, sorry, sorry again uh, for this uh, rather problematic outcome. And it's problematic because the typical issues are always the same in Europe at the moment. There are technical interoperability problems, it's unclear which law is applicable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and at the very end, the outcome of this would be ask the patients for reconsent. And asking 20,000 patients for reconsent is, uh, is, is an absolute showstopper, so the, 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 the story always ends there. Many European research projects end there, and when you look into this then a little bit more into detail, you find out that data protection law in Europe, as it looks like at the moment, is constantly misused by, uh, by, in particular by medical doctors in order to be a kind of weapon of mass destruction to protect business interests they have, which is a kind of IP right that they claim to have in reality on the patient's data person, or, or the, the personal information um, of the patient. And data protection is therefore often used as a kind of hidden argument or an argument hiding the real argument behind, which is the business interest. My main lessons that I learned so far from the many projects I, I, I had the privilege to work in was uh, lawyers are needed from the very beginning because uh, if you only ask them at the very end, the outcome is the typical answer, that won't work, right? So you need them from the beginning. Uh, you, it's better to have a central data controller in uh, your scenario. You need patients and patient, info and patient organizations in there because nobody knows patients' interests better than they do. And you need legally binding contracts between participants. And there's a last message learned, which is nobody likes penalty clauses. And if you put penalty clauses into your contract, then people start thinking about whether it's really wise to sign them. And now the rules change. On the 25th of May 2018, which is two days before I get 50, so my birthday, my 50th birthday is on the 27th of May 2018, which is important because this will keep me in business for the rest of my professional life. So this is the best, this is the best possible birthday present you can think about. So on the 25th May of 2018, the general data protection uh, regulation will be to be applied. It's already in force, so it's already part of the existing European law, but it will need to be applied from the 25th of May 2018 onwards, and it's supposed to change the rules in a world in which 1984 it doesn't look like 1984. So let's check whether this is true. We have a broken law situation at the very beginning. We have enshrined information in each clinic. We have paper everywhere. Um, and we have now a proposal that was proposed in 2012. So it's important to know that this general data protection regulation has already six years of legal history behind it before it starts to be applicable. This is the paper the European Commission proposed in January 2012, giving three promises or three basic understanding. One was one continent, one law. The second one is, this is now ready for the internet. This is no longer pre-internet legislation. And the third one, which is also an important difference between Europe and the US, at least in my perception, is this is a general data protection regulation saying it's applicable for everything, for Facebook, for Google, and also for your medical treatment. We don't have specialized legislation. This is for everything. One size fits all. So these three promises are the one that need to be now controlled and checked. And what I would like to do in the second chapter now is to argue that uh, the principles remain, the primary law remains, Article 8 of the General Data Protection Regulation remains, but the issues remain as well. And the reason for this is the principles, many of the principles remain, and the question now is what about the, the question of 
difference between treatment and secondary use research data under this new framework? This is the only question that I can have a closer look into now for time reasons. Well, Article 5 of the regulation says that personal data shall only be processed for a specific purpose. This is the old known purpose limitation that you know. However, when you read a little bit closer, you also find that there is um, an ongoing argument in this now saying that further processing of data for scientific purposes shall be considered to be uh, not incompatible, um, so shall be compatible with the initial purpose. So whenever something is done for research, at least in principle, it, sh it is compatible with the original purpose, provided that the limitations of Article 89, which is another boring article, are, um, are obeyed. Article 89 is about uh, additional safeguards, in particular uh, technical and organizational measures that need to be in place. Minimization principle, pseudonymization, anonymization needs to be in place. But if this is met, then the processing for uh, research may be possible. That is, I would say, a change. And it's an important change because it will probably uh, lead to a situation where a lot of the things that we already know will become trickier on the one hand, and one thing will become less tricky. The trickier things will be to deal with supervisory authorities because they will have more power, they will have higher fines to fine, etc. They will be more influential in the game. Also, data protection officers will become more important. Every single European hospital will need to have a data protection officer from 2018, and me being a data protection officer of my university can tell you that this is something where you can try this to change things, but it's an ongoing burden to try to change things because the data protection officer, as every lawyer, is never asked in advance. He's always asked at the very end when everything is already broken. Um, certifications, self-organizations, uh, industry standards as a guidance will become more important. Privacy enhancing technologies will be more important and at the very end somebody will need to pay for all of this and this will be the head of the organization. So accountability, accountability issues will become more important. On the other hand, papers, fines and administrative burdens will increase. What will possibly shrink in its importance at least that would be my assumption today, will be that patients should be asked to reconsent when their data is to be used for uh, research purposes for the reasons that I mentioned before. And I would really love to learn from you about what you think about this. Just let me finish with a rather provoking sentence from another academic that I found that might help us in structuring the discussion. It is a fallacy. It's a fallacy to believe that where there is no consent, there must be a wrong, and or consent is the only justification where a prima facie right is violated. And conversely, it's also a fallacy to believe that where there is consent, there is no wrong. Thank you very much for having me here, and I'm very open to questions. you would like to use, well, mine doesn't work either. <laughs> but you can get on stage, that one works. <laughs> uh, my name is Dennis Mellon, and I'm with the Drexel College of Medicine and also uh, president of Bella Media LLC. One of the questions I have about your approach, the European approach to privacy, is also one that I, when I talk about consent, I wonder what the role is of the institutional review board. Yeah. And when I look at institute, institutional review board, uh, what I hear in the U.S. is they're overburdened, that the, the rules on privacy uh, and security sometimes can be a little overwhelming for them because they have a host of other things to deal with. 
yeah. and that controls on privacy and security are interfering with the research. And part of the concern is, or one argument uh, uh, for that is that, oh my God, researchers now have to be more circumspect, or better yet, more organized, mm -hmm. and have clear ideas of what they want their research to do, or what their research is. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether in your experience, you're finding that the, the emphasis on personal rights to data has actually increased researchers' ability, researchers' motivation to be clearer on what kind of research they want to do and what is the outcome of that research? Um, actually, in, uh, I, I think um, protocols have become stricter, so people need to describe a lot more and they need to fill out a lot more of papers. I don't know whether they are more precise in describe or and whether they should be more precise in describing what they really want to achieve with their research due to data protection reasons. And and the reason why I don't think so is that in my view there needs to be a fundamental distinction to be made between the data protection part and the other ethical parts of research. And data protection is not ethics, it's clear law. So there are strict rules on this. And therefore, an ethics committee, although it's an important player in the game, is not the, the right body answering legal questions. And the legal question is whether there is a purpose, a research purpose, whether the, uh, the infringement of the privacy right is proportionate in relation to that research purpose. That's the legal question. And uh, I think it can, this question can be answered uh, properly also in situations where doctors not yet know what they want to achieve with their research, provided that the privacy of the patient is taken into consideration in outbalancing this properly. And we are not very good in this in Europe at the moment for reasons that I mentioned. One of them is ethics committees answer legal questions, which is not what they are supposed to do. Hi, this is Nancy Anthracite. I'm a physician. Um, one of the things I've noticed is it seems to me when you have a privacy officer, very often, very often the legal opinion is sought as a way to get around what they think might be stopping the release. And usually those phrases of sort that you mentioned are used as reasons. Either, you know, it's for the greater good for the public health or there's all sorts of other reasons. And usually I find that there's a blanket release Mm -hmm. out to allow to do this as opposed to blocking the release of private information. The second thing being in also the institutional review, board, review boards, having been one who was thrown off of one because I tried to protect patient privacy and they felt I was getting in the way of research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I completely share both arguments probably. <laughs> also the first one in particular. Um, um, the, uh, and the only, um, the only countermeasure that I know is to speak as much and to discuss as much as possible with uh, the officers and the data protection officers and in academia. It's, an, it's, it's a very fundamental issue and, and we need to debate this. And, I'm, and I mean, this is one example of how to debate this. Yeah, and the, the whole problem with anonymizing and uh, de-identifying stuff, uh, you know, the, in, in the United States there's law regarding that, which is being, is not adequate. Yeah. And as a result, people legally get the opinion you're fine to do what you're doing when this stuff can be re-identified. Yeah, that's an issue also in Europe. And, and the problem, of course, as all of you know, is an, anonymity in, in the big data world is impossible. I mean, it's not, I, I wouldn't call it impossible, but it's, it's not, not easy to achieve, right? And, and it's not that trivial. And it's seen, compl it's, the problem is underestimated everywhere. Yeah. I'm Michael Nelson. I do public policy for Cloudflare, which is a web security firm based in San Francisco, but we have offices in London, so we're paying a lot of attention to the GDPR. I had hoped to ask this to Isabel falk Perton, but you might be a better person to ask. So far, the Germans have passed their legislation to implement the GDPR. The Irish have put out a draft but we're still waiting for a lot of other countries, including France. So my question is, do you have any sense of how long we will have to wait to see actual implement, implementing regulation? And do you have a sense of where there might be some differences between what the different countries do? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, it has two parts. The first one, how long you have to wait. I'm quite sure that you will need to wait longer than 
to the 25th of May 2018 because some countries will be late. I'm quite sure that some countries will be late. That, that's a, a long tradition in Europe that some countries are late in transposing. And there might be some countries who will, that would even decide not to do anything. That might also be a way to deal with this. And the outcome of this will be that this central promise, one continent, one law, will not become true because it will again be 27 countries and 27 or 55 different laws in many aspects because there are between 30 or 70 clauses in the general data protection regulation, it depends on how you count them, where there is a possibility that a member state makes a law on this, but there is no obligation. And, and countries deal with this very differently. So probably the best tactics at the moment from a US perspective would be to deal with the general data protection regulation only and to try to, to focus on this and to monitor what's going to happen in the other member states. I know that, for example, in Austria, which is my country of origin, um, there is a draft already published, but that will never become law because there is an election ongoing, blah, 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 and therefore it will be, we will be most probably very late, if not too late. Yeah, and that's true for many others. So that's a very, I mean, this is very, uh, very unfortunate. Yeah. But it was the price that needed to be paid for the compromise to achieve uh, when this general data protection regulation was in the making. Uh, it was probably the most lobbied and most controversial piece of legislation that was ever um, um, discussed in Brussels. And as far as differences that we might see? Um, differences in, in the timing or in the in, in, in the, the understanding. Legislation. I mean, the uh, German the, versus really, the I mean, Irish. I mean, the most different the most different uh, legislation will leave the union. Uh, so the UK will leave in a way that that was in the moment always very different from many others. Um, but uh, uh, then uh, there will be important differences also in this area here because one of the one of the uh, exit scenarios is, is that the member state law may allow and may specify secondary use more precisely than the regulation as such does. And I would assume that member states will deal with this very differently. Thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas Welch. I'm an attorney and I used to work for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, with regard to the right to be forgotten, uh, the United States has a serious problem with medical error. It's estimated by several studies to be the third largest cause of death in the United States. I wondered how the right to be forgotten for patients uh, deals with uh, studies regarding medical error, yeah. malpractice cases, which do not arise perhaps for one or two years following the treatment and also with regard to pandemic diseases, um, for example, a patient that has been traveling to a Ebola affected area. Okay, that's a very, very good question. Again, um, to, to put it very briefly, um, if, if there is a law asking for data to be stored, there won't be such, right, such a thing like a right to be forgotten. And there's also a European a court decision on this already, uh, dealing with data of businesses, whether a business owner might have a right to be forgotten if that business runs bankrupt. And the answer of the European Court of Justice on this was no, there is none. Um, so, so when it comes to medical documentation that is clearly uh, ru uh, regulated in a law, I don't think that anything will be changed due to this right to be forgotten. Uh, Adrian Gropper, uh, Patient Privacy Rights. Uh, your, your talk starts with just a brilliant, clear explanation of the power asymmetry issues in mm. healthcare and uh, the role of technology that 1984 won't be like 1984. And you end on uh, consent uh, with respect to research, but it could also apply to various things like treatment. And that I find kind of frustrating, to be honest, because the discussion of consent does not deal with the power asymmetry or with the human dignity aspects that you so brilliantly introduced. Uh, so do you expect um, these laws, these legal changes with GDPR to actually impact the way technology, people interact with technology, the way that personal computer would? 
or is it just more centralization and more bureaucracy, as you sort of pointed out in your last slide about uh, mm. you know, the authorities? Um, actually, I don't think, uh, so I completely share your pessimistic ending in a way, right? So uh, I, I think that uh, the, 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 for me, the most intriguing question at the moment is how to deal with this whole concept, con concept of consent in, in this ongoing scenario and world. Uh, I don't think that the GDPR gives too many new answers to this apart from that consent is becoming less important in some areas. Definitely. But the, the problems as such remain quite the same. And, and that has probably something to do with how law works in a society. I don't know whether law is the best tool um, to make that better. It would be probably technology to help here. And, and, and therefore, privacy enhancing technologies and consent supporting technologies are that important. The problem there is the law can't, I mean, I can't prescribe and ask that they need to be developed. I mean, I can, as a legislator, I can ask that they should be to be developed, but the problem is if nobody develops them, they are still not there, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's just a trigger um, that the law can be, but we need technology here. And I'm opt when I'm, when in, in my better days, when I'm optimistic, I trust that technology will solve the issue. <laughs> yeah. Very quick, we have a break coming up here, and you know, you Sorry, I'm too long. I'm sorry. No, 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 <laughs> can, no. can I ask my question, Tom? <laughs> Lucia Savage, Amata Health. Um, so I used to work at HHS, and I was privileged to work at a time when the administration was really grappling with the balance of uh, dignity and also a much higher level of patient activism, particularly for researching complicated and rare diseases. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we have a whole new regulatory scheme and the common rule, which is just become final recently. And I was wondering if that same thing is happening in Europe, where technology is kind of unleashing certain parts of the individual population to say, no, 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 I actually want to actively get engaged in my research. I want my data to flow. I don't want it to be locked up behind a 109-page consent. That just, sure. as, a, as a lawyer, that makes me cringe. But what, what's happening in Europe on the patient side? I think you have both tendencies, as in the U.S., also in Europe. You have patient organizations who are very pro-privacy and pro-put uh, the patient in, in the driving seat and let him control or her control the data. And on the other hand, you have movements open up everything and share everything. Um, I, I think both extremisms are not representative. I think the typical European patient organization is somewhere in, in between those two positions. And, but they are very, very concerned. All the patient organizations that I know, they are very concerned about data protection and they are very actively trying to participate in this debate. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate it.